Uh, hello everyone, my name is Winter, uh, and uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, designing for machine learning driven features. Um, these are drawn from uh, my experience working at Share Systems, and uh, hopefully you'll find them helpful. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm a product designer. Um, I founded and led the product design team at Share Systems. Uh, you might be wondering who is Share Systems. So, <laughs> Uh, at Care Systems, we uh, help lawyers and other professionals, such as auditors, um, review and make sense of really large amount of legal documents uh, using machine learning. So it doesn't really sound that sexy at all, um, but here you go. So a little bit about machine learning, um, since that's sort of the technology we get to work with. Um, so first of all, it's not magic. Um, it is a subfield of uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, ha highly related to statistics and probability. And it's very good for tasks such as uh, classifying things, uh, predicting things, and clustering things. Um, so think about your like a lot of the products that you use every day, like Spotify and uh, Amazon, Google. A lot of these things actually. Um, use different kind of algorithms to uh, accomplish some of these tasks. Um, and it might be helpful to also know that mainly there are different, two different kind, well, three different kinds actually, but um, to make things a bit simpler. So supervised, supervised machine learning is the kind of uh, machine learning where you teach the system to understand certain things, whereas unsupervised, um, uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithm is basically the machine just does things on it, um, such as clustering, uh, which I will talk about in a bit. So um, designing a machine learning driven product. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll talk about uh, the lessons that I've learned, um, some of the challenges that we face uh, designing such products, not only in the context of Kira, but also um, machine learning driven products at large. Uh, and then some of the, I call them suggestions, but it's really something that I personally find helpful. Uh, so here we go, lessons. Um, first and foremost um, is really what I've learned. Um, if there's anything that you will remember from my rambling today is remember this, right? The most important thing is really understand your user's mental model and match the interface to it. And you know, like, for those of you who are actually uh, UX designers or product designers, this is nothing new or groundbreaking. Nielsen, um, Jack, Jacob Nielsen and Don Norman has been talking about this since the 90s. But um, it's, I really want to emphasize how important it is. And the second thing is really adapt your interaction based on the kind of user tasks. Um, what you'll find is that certain algorithms are better at certain tasks than others. So understanding what their goals are, what their um, tasks are, is really, and adapting your interface and interaction to it is really, really important. And in the end, um, establishing trust and allowing uh, negotiation. So users need to be able to negotiate with your system. Uh, and then I'll use a case study to sort of illustrate uh, those points. And this case study is when uh, we designed something called the document clustering. Uh, so using an unsupervised machine learning algorithm to um, group similar documents together. Um, you might be thinking, OK, how hard is that? Um, interestingly, so machine does its thing. It groups similar documents together. But what counts as similar document? There is, um, if you look at all the documents that it clusters, it's really, really hard to put a label or attributes on it. Um, you know, is, is it the type of document? Is it the title? Is it the way it's formatted? It's none of these, uh, is none of a simple or like a single thing. It's a combination of a lot of the things. Um, so the de design challenge that we face is, okay, how do we design the interface and experience such that um, users can actually find it, um, can find it useful? So in the beginning, obviously, when you think of cluster, that is, the first thing you think of a kind of visualization where you have like dots or clusters. Um, and 
So the first thing, so we did a few rounds of user interviews and trying to sort of understand, okay, do they find it helpful? Um, how do they see this, th this thing? And the first thing we learned about user's mental model is, um, uh, consider this quote. Someone said, I don't know what the computer is looking at. I'm really hesitant to trust it, and I don't know how it's grouping. And so what does this quote tell us? It tells us that uh, users won't intuitively trust a black box algorithm. When you work with any sort of you know, machine learning algorithm or whatever, uh, as a designer or as someone who actually works on the algorithm, you're like, of course you'll trust it, right? It's accurate or whatever. But uh, for users, that's just not like, trust is not their intuition. And the second thing we learned uh, is illustrated in this quote. Someone said, there's got to be a punchy way to explain uh, why something's an outlier. So when you group similar similar things together, there's ought to be a group where things are outliers that don't really belong to any of the groups. So um, what does this tell us? It basically tells us that um, when trust isn't there, uh, people would want an explanation. And it's, that's pretty intuitive, right? Like if you don't really trust someone, then whatever they do, you like, there has to be a way to explain this. Um, so then, okay, so you think that, so first of all, they wouldn't intuitively trust uh, this algorithm and they want an explanation. And so as a designer or um, someone who is working on a system, you think, okay, they, um, they must want transparency. They want it to understand, right? But is it? Is, is it transparency that they want? So now let's take a detour and think about uh, the Amazon recommendation system. Um, so this is the kind of interface you see. This is a screenshot of uh, my Amazon interface. And you can see that I buy a lot of design and comic books. Um, so think about this for a while. Do you know how this works? Do you know how Amazon recommendation system works? So if I were to tell you that uh, common recommender systems use techniques such as collaborative filtering or um, singular value decomposition, um, does that kind of explanation help you understand how it works? Maybe if you're a developer, it does. Um, but was that how you thought it worked? And um, do you actually need to know exactly how it works to actually use it? And I'll probably venture to say, not really. Um, so then why is it that when you look at this interface, you don't really know how exactly the technical details of how it works, but you are able to intuitively understand how it works. Uh, you know, in your mind, it's like, if I like this book, I'll like that book. If I bought this kind of book, I'll like, they'll recommend. Like, so this is um, exactly my point of they were able to understand your mental model of how certain things work and match their interface to it. So now let's go back to our question about whether it is transparency that we should provide. Um, I would propose it is not transparency, it is interpretability. It is the ability that people should have to interpret, to understand um, your interface by providing some, by providing users something that they're really, really familiar with. So familiarity. Because of um, because this kind of familiarity, they were able to interpret the uh, interface and um, they were able to predict what's going to happen. So giving them uh, predictability. And uh, ultimately, that's how you build trust. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, adapting the interaction based on tasks. So throughout our interview uh, with our users, which are mostly um, transaction lawyers who work on uh, margin acquisition sort of deals, um, we understand, we, we really got a chance to understand you know, what their goals are, what their motivations are, and what their tasks are based on their goals and motivations. So um, ultimately, for a margin acquisition deal, the most important thing is being able to identify risks in such transactions. And it's really, it's a highly stressful situation. Um, 
you know, they usually are given a really short period of time and they need to go through thousands of documents and looking for those like needle in a haystack kind of thing. So in those, so given those kind of context, we understand that um, efficiency is their priority. That is the, like that is the number one thing. Which led us to actually realize document clustering, the thing that I showed you, um, is the most uh, helpful when it's for a project management type of task. And in particular, people really, um, the, where it shines is that people want to assign similar documents to the same reviewer to review because that would really increase the kind of efficiency. So um, under, understanding this kind of background would um, allow us to transform something uh, like this into ultimately something like that, which looks completely different and uh, not as, I guess, innovative or sexy as other things, but here we go. Um, so what we learned here is, you know, sometimes good enough is good enough. Um, and as you have trust, um, so last thing, that kind of leads to the last point, which is trust and negotiation. Once trust is established, um, users are actually more likely to tolerate inaccuracy uh, and more likely to negotiate with the system, even though intuitively you would think um, you know, accuracy is probably the most important thing if they see something that you know, is not accurate, they'll probably like you to abandon it. Uh, but the key here is once you give something that people can interpret and they can understand, once that trust is built, uh, they could actually tolerate a little bit of inaccuracy and um, spending some time to sort of changing things, negotiating with things, um, which also means the design implication is that um, allowing that kind of user control is really, really important. So give them a way to actually negotiate with the system. And uh, next thing I want to talk about are some of the challenges faced in designing a really sort of black box ish and uh, fuzzy algorithms and which is really the biggest thing is the imperfection of the results you might get uh, none of the algorithms um, is perfect there's always a little bit of inaccuracy um, that is kind of built into it and because of this kind of imperfection is think about you know um, how many have are here use Spotify right whenever you get a music recommendation, you will never get the exact thing that you want. Like whatever recommendation recommendation you get, there's always something you're like, eh, I'm not sure why I get this, right? So, how would um, how do as designers dealing with these kind of things? Um, how how do you deal with imperfections? So especially uh, think about uh, when there are imperfections, um, how do you make things interpretable? How do you make things predictable in a way. Um, and also, how much negotiation is enough? You don't probably want people to like do a lot of manual work to actually correct you. So um, finding that balance. Um, so I'm tossing these challenges to you um, to think about. I don't have an answer. And uh, lastly, some of the things I found really, really helpful in uh, designing for things like this is uh, really basic things. Know your design heuristics. Um, if you know uh, Nielsen's design heuristics, these are you know some of the things I just talked about. It really reinforces some of the heuristics that he established a very very long time ago. Things like you know giving giving feedback, giving control. Um, things like you know under like matching their mental models. All of these kind of things are um, already described. Um, in these heuristics. And uh, the importance of doing user research, um, there are so many ways that we can do research. You can do interviews, there are um, ethnographical kind of research, you could um, do carb sorting, there's like mix and match your uh, research techniques in order to unpack their mental models. And uh, one of the things that I find to be really particular for kind of machine learning algorithm is that uh, you have to really test with real data as early as you can. Uh, there are 
there, because of that imperfection we just talked about, um, there's a difference between testing a concept, which means like you know you do paper prototyping or whatever. Um, but if the results, like the effectiveness of the of your design, really comes across from the actual results. So if you do end up working with something like this, I really encourage you to try to test with real data as soon as you can. And uh, that brings me to the next point, which is uh, really uh, collaborate with data scientists who work on these algorithms. These become their best friends and collaborate with them. And this is, I guess, one of the best ways you could try to test with real data, right? Um, and then bonus, if you wanted to learn some machine learning basics, that would be really helpful. That would really kind of help you. Um, is you know, we still talk about you know designers and developers, um, designers being able to, you know, talk in development terms and have building that bridge to work with them. And it's the same, right? Like the more you could actually understand these technical things, the better you can communicate uh, with your data scientists. Um, and lastly. There are a lot of academic papers out there. A lot of people in the academic field are doing this kind of research to try to understand the design implications um, of designing you know, information retrieval systems and uh, recommendation systems, such things like this. So um, if you want it, uh, Google Scholar is a really, really great place to look for academic papers. Um, for the uh, Machine Learning Basics, Coursera, there are a lot of courses, uh, really, really good machine learning courses on Coursera. You can check them out. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, what I have to say today. Question? Oh, question. Yes. Um, It's yes. So the question is, uh, um, the Amazon recommendation system still uses a lot of people, um, but using me mechanical Turks, which is kind of a crowdsourcing um, platform where people get paid to do certain tasks, right? Um, this that's actually interesting. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting to think in terms of. You know what much the algorithm what the algorithm is doing is really not really that different how from how we think about you know when you recommend people things based on certain things there is no um, you might look at a variety of different they call them features in machine learning right like it could be the type of box it could be the author it could be um, what what else could it be? there are so many kind of different features that um, people are looking at. Uh, in terms of recommending things, and that's ultimately what the algorithm is learning by combining all of these features together. Right, so yeah. it's getting better and better, but we're like not at the point where like, you can exclude people from Yeah, I don't, I don't think you could ever have a perfect, as I said, I don't think you would ever have a perfect algorithm. Um, they could, I, I mean, they probably could exclude the people part, but it's just that it's just a different way of thinking about this thing, I guess. Yeah. Yes? So I, I actually think that Amazon has it easy because they have all the sales data. Mm -hmm. You know, and like person A bought these two books and that happens 10,000, 100,000 times. And yeah. so they can say, you know, they can present that to you as, yeah. a, as a carrot, you know, to get you yeah. to buy that second sure. book or whatever, right? Yeah. So the recommendation engine really is just big data. And just some, you know, rudimentary code. Yeah. But um, I, I'm looking at what you're doing here, and I'm going, Jesus, that data is so nebulous. Like, I mean, like, how do you even begin to categorize the documents in the first place in in order to be able to say that this A is is related to B? 
Yeah, that's so. The question is, uh, for commercial systems such as Amazon, they have a, they have enough a big enough data that um, do training this kind of algorithm is, is easy. Yeah, and that's I think that's a really really good point. Um, a lot of you might know that in terms of algorithms, data is crucial, and it's the more data you have, the better. I wouldn't say that. The more and better data you have, right? Like it's also about the kind of training data you feed it. Sometimes, you, like it depends on that kind of match between the data that you feed it and the sort of tasks this algorithm is like designed to do in a way. But the, so, but yeah. the starting point would be parsing these documents and, and somehow characterizing, giving the document properties that you can use to. To then on the next level start to match them with other documents, mm -hmm. and I, I it just totally do. Yeah, actually, uh, the clustering thing that we use is actually on super an unsupervised algorithm, so there was actually no training per se. Uh, we do have other features so that relies on patterns, and but uh, they, in in a way, it sort of takes the documents, um, turns them into vectors, uh, and then compares the vectors. It's a little different than having training data and uh, getting the results. So the question is, uh, do we look at different, uh, I guess, user personas and what they like, what their tasks and what their goals are, and contextualize the interface to it? Um, that would ultimately be the goal. We're not there yet. Um, but in this particular feature, the way we did the testing is actually we did three major um, phases of research and design. So like the the first version and last version look completely different, work completely differently, and um, we did. Um, we interviewed about twenty-seven people. Did test in a combination of interview and testing. And the last phase of the research, what we did is, you know, as you're building a product, you obviously one of the things like prioritize uh, this thing. And mm -hmm. so our understanding is, as I said, it's a really good feature for project management so that project managers could assign similar documents to the same reviewer. So we basically locked down to this particular use case and said, we're going to just uh, make sure we optimize this particular use case. And uh, so in the, last, in the last round, one of our hypotheses was actually um, the way people interact with this and the way people, uh, how much they trust such a thing is probably related to their role. For example, if you're a reviewer, maybe you care about accuracy a little more. If you're a project manager, you're like, I'm just gonna like dump these documents to reviewers and let them figure out kind of thing. Um, so we did um, test this feature with, I think we probably interviewed about eight people and three of them were not project managers, they're reviewers and the rest are uh, project managers. And um, this hypothesis, particular hypothesis, wasn't either accepted or rejected, but we did find among the project managers that we that we tested, um, the results were really positive. So yeah, so definitely, I think um, if resource limitation or whatever, you can't do all of these parallel uses all together. At least make sure that you optimize for one thing and really understand that use case. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So when I think of like machine learning and especially the legal profession, mm -hmm. uh, I just see like wrongful conviction, and, you know, and this is what's kind of like flashing in my head. And I, I was even reading that they're automating divorces now. Hello, but um, have you come across whether it be you know something that you saw yourself or stand or like whether you know some cases out there where machine learning and legal has gone that drastically well? 
uh, in Kira, we don't really deal with conviction, that kind of thing. So um, I haven't come across anything from the use case that I directly am involved in. But what you've said is actually a really, really huge debate um, currently in terms of you know justice and technology and that kind of thing, right? Like there was a thing called Campus. I don't know if you heard. Um, it's basically a justice system where they would predict the likelihood or probability of some uh, repeat offender. And um, there is a book called The Weapons of Math Destruction, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, it, where it talks about you know, how like, it reinforces that kind of racial profile. Um, but I guess math destruction. Uh, but the thing is, as I said, it, like the algorithm, a lot of it is based on the kind of data you feed it, right? So it's if the person who is kind of um, making these kind of judgment think that it's really, it really depends on the kind of data that you feed it. I'm, again, not a machine learning expert, so I probably should not <laughs> say a lot of the technical things. Um, but within our field, um, that is a really good point. So lawyers are really, really skeptical by definition. So a lot of our users, and that's why I really, um, when I was thinking through these things, trust is a huge deal for our users. Like for music recommendation, for example, it's important, like people study this, these kind of things, but like it's not, you're not gonna die if you're getting a recommendation that is not perfect, right? Whereas in some of these cases that we deal with, a uh, merger and acquisition, kind of transaction of big companies buying another company. If you miss something or you misinterpret something, like you're gonna face, you know, a lot like the stake is really, really high. So um, this is where all, like I think it's a continuous kind of exploration where we try to find um, a really good balance between the human um, and the machine, like sort of working together, right? A lot of uh, what we do is really trying to take that sort of manual, repetitive um, process out of their way so that they can focus on the important things. Yeah. Is that answer? Thank you, Winter. Yeah. Thanks.